start with you sharing just a little bit with everyone about what Endeavor does and sure. what you've been up to. Sure, Endeavor this year turns 20 years old. It's hard to believe. Uh, 20 years ago, we actually started in Latin America. Today, we are in 30 countries and five US cities. Actually, the managing director of Endeavor Louisville is in the house. And, um, but we started out 20 years ago with this idea that there were these high growth, what we call high impact entrepreneurs outside Silicon Valley and, and pockets, you know, in places like maybe Israel and, mm -hmm. and the UK. And no one thought this was a good idea. Um, I, I was told there were no entrepreneurs in places like Latin America or the Middle East or Southeast Asia. And that if I found them, I would never be able to trust them and who would support them anyway. As one kid said to me, you know, this Steve Jobs story, Apple computer, Hewlett in the garage, I don't even have a garage. Um, but uh, I was called the Chica, Chica Loca, the crazy girl, and uh, luckily we got our start in Argentina, and uh, today when you look at many of the unicorns, Globant being uh, high among them, met most of them got their start with Endeavor, and what's more important is what we said is we're building ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to just create one company to create jobs. You've got to pay it forward. You've got to angel invest. You've got to tell your story, mm -hmm. because that's how ecosystems are built. And if you look at stories like Silicon Valley, it's about that interconnectivity. So that's one of the reasons I'm so proud to be part of Globant, because it's a microcosm itself of what Endeavor does because Globant itself is about building cultures and ecosystems. Yeah, so you know, I hear you talking a lot about um, building connections. And you know, we work with companies helping them with their digital transformations across yeah. technology and experience and strategy and culture. Right. Um, a lot of the things that you work with companies around startups and that entrepreneurial spirit, I, I would guess there are a lot of patterns you could identify to say, what are you looking for when you look at a company and identify that they're ready for a disruption or they're ready mm -hmm. for a change or ready for a pivot? You know, could you talk a little bit about some of the things you look for? Yeah, and it's interesting because we don't enter at the startup phase. We enter at the scale-up phase, right? So we're looking for that inflection that moment, point, that right. moment, that mm -hmm. pivotal transformation you're talking about. I'd say first we look to the leadership. Um, I always say, show me the org chart and I'll, I'll learn a lot. Is this a one person <laughs> show or do they have three co-CEOs and no one's making decisions? And in fact, again, back to the Globant story, one of the things that first attracted to me and impressed me about this team is that you had, everyone had a division of labor. It was clear what Gieber did, it was clear what Nestor did, it was clear what uh, you know, Martin Umaran did, and then Migoya was the CEO empowered with that ultimate decision making. And what's amazing is today, you know, they're all still here, they're all still passionately contributing because they knew their, their lane. Mm -hmm. And I think that we often find places where the, the CEO themselves or the leadership is not willing or able to make that change. They're not willing to enable to empower the next mm -hmm. you know, set of employees. Um, so that's that's the first thing, and and then I think that you learn a lot from what your your customers tell mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So in Endeavor's case, we were told recently, for example, that um, that we have been organizing just geographically, and and our entrepreneurs we now have fifteen hundred entrepreneurs in these thirty countries working in a variety of industries, and they said, you know what, we know everyone in Indonesia, we know everyone in Brazil, that's not interesting for us to have you headquarter people in New York organizing us, and we all know each other. We want to be, we want to meet people in our verticals. Mm -hmm. And so we started, so again, we have Louisville here, we brought people from Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Colombia, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, to Louisville for an F&B tour, because we have a lot of food and beverage CEOs in that uh, community. We're doing a fintech tour. Uh, we did one last week. Mm. So I think that that really came, again, your customers will tell you a lot about when they're ready to transform and when they're meeting different challenges, your organization cannot stay the same to help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, uh, it's one of the topics that we spend a lot of time on is yes. talking about culture. And as you go through digital transformation, you are changing a lot of processes. You're changing yeah. the ways that you work. And necessarily, at some point, 
you also need to address, you probably need to change something formally in the organizational structure, right? Totally. Um, and I'm hearing that's something that Endeavor noticed. It's not just what your customers told you, but you also said we need to adjust our structure to better meet what the customers are asking for. Yeah, and it's interesting because even though we're working primarily at Endeavor with, with these scale-ups, right, companies that come to us with 10 to 1,000 employees but want to you know, go grow 10x, right? They're at that growth moment. But I do a lot of work with the Fortune 500 companies. And what I'm struck with is there's a lot of lip service today being paid to cultures of intrapreneurship. And, mm -hmm. But the, man, the managers are terrified. They do not believe that if they have an idea that they can go to their boss, they think they're going to lose their, their job or they're not going to get the, the funding. And so I started studying, well, what works for these, these I don't like the word entrepreneur, I call them skunks, um, partly because of Lockheed Martin's famous Skunk Works project that was secret, but also because if you're a skunk, your goal is to stink up the joint. And so my favorite thing is when people from Ernst & Young go, Linda, Linda, I'm a skunk, thank you. Um, but what I learned is they don't go to their boss first. Mm -hmm. They often get, they, they start with very little money, so it doesn't take a lot of budget. They start testing. You know, there were these two women at Clorox. They were vice presidents. They were moms, and so they had the first co-shared job title. Um, and in fact, they merged their names to Samantha and Mary Jo, so it became Sam. So you would always get Sam no matter who was on duty. <laughs> But what happened was they were moms too and they were out in the playground and heard a lot of customers complaining about the lack of environmental products. And so they ba basically went to the, the supermarket, started buying up every ingredient and came through their off time Saturdays, ended up coming up with Clorox Greenworks, which be initially uh, launched at $60 million in revenues yeah, and became a new whole mm -hmm. brand line. But again, it was about two things. One is starting small, convincing people who might not be your direct boss or your, mm -hmm. your direct teammates, hey, I have this idea, do you have this pain point, can I solve it? And then gathering the proof points before they went and asked. And the other thing is a manager, um, I, my, my favorite um, quote by uh, Jeff Bezos is he believes in two pizza teams. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is a two pizza team? And the answer is actually pretty simple, that if you have any group of people working on any task that's larger than two pizzas can feed, it's an ineffective team, not agile, won't get anything done. So now I always think about the two pizza teams. Unless you have some really big eaters on your team, <laughs> then you yeah. have to find a new formula. <laughs> but, but yeah, I love that. I love that as well. So. Challenger mindset, that's, that's a big part of finding the people yeah. that have that challenger mindset. Um, it's something in transformation that's really important. Digital transformation, scale up moments, whatever those pivot moments. Finding the people who are willing and brave <laughs> and, and, and yeah. you know, willing to take their ideas and have these conversations within an organization. Um, one of the things I love that, that you talk about are taking your ideas out of the shower, right? Could you talk a little bit about that and you know, how you see that play out in the different businesses that you've worked with? Yeah, look, well, my own story, I grew up um, outside of Boston to a very traditional family. My parents had met as childhood sweethearts. My dad has worked in the same law firm his entire career. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. And after I'd gone, up to, I'd gone to Harvard and then to Yale Law School and I thought, all right, we know Linda's grumbling about not going to law, but she's going to go become a management consultant, or maybe she'll work at Goldman Sachs. Like, we understand these things. And when I told them, they overheard me and my co-founder, Peter, talking about scheming up Endeavor. They got very nervous. And they just thought this sounded insane, that I was going to get on all these planes, not have a, a, a stable, that I didn't come from a family that had a trust fund, so I would have no stable income, and I wouldn't be able to produce grandchildren. That was my mother's worry. My, my uh, daughter is untethered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's, she's, she's right. She's, and so I, I had, we were at the, I call this my kitchen table moment, because it was that moment when, do I do the safe and expected and what my parents want me to do? Or do I venture into the unknown? And it was this moment where I said, I can't not do this idea. And so I think either, when, whether you're an entrepreneur starting something new, or whether you're inside a company and you have a new idea, giving yourself permission mm -hmm. is often that hardest step. And often people say, oh, my boss won't like it, my spouse won't like it, but really it's themselves. And so yeah. one, that's why my motto is that crazy is a compliment, and that if you're not being called crazy, you're not thinking big enough. But just that concept of, oh my God, it's not about 
about the budget size. It's about my permission to think differently and maybe, you know, maybe disrupt what I've even been working on. Right. And I think as we talk about some of these new concepts that we've been discussing today, AI and cognitive and, and all of these words that might feel really distant or unachievable, we need to kind of break the barriers down and uh -huh. you know, call ourselves crazy and get started. Um, forging new ground and, and yeah. asking ourselves why and taking on that challenger mindset. And, and let me just say, one of the things I love about Globend is it never stops innovating and never stops being agile and entrepreneurial. And as I was walking in today, bleary-eyed, because I was in San Francisco last night and just got off the red eye, and, and Gebert comes and says, Linda, I have an idea. What we're doing is help large, helping large companies build their startups. This is what we're doing. We're completely transforming how Globend is operating, because we're enabling them to disrupt themselves and build their startups. And I thought, actually, that's genius. Because I think every organization, whether large, medium, or, or small, knows the only thing that is risky is not taking any risks, yep. and that the world is chaotic. And so if you're prizing stability, you're, you've missed the boat. You have to realize that chaos is your friend, and you've got to disrupt yourselves. But yet, creating that structure and that mindset you were talking about and that team structure that, that empowers and really enables people yep. to, to take uh, you know, that first leap of faith is very hard to institutionalize. Yeah, I, I agree. We worked uh, once with a CEO, worked with for quite some time, who all signs pointed to the need to rework their business. All data pointed to the need to rework their business. And months passed, months passed, nothing changed, no action. And it wasn't until he said, I'm emotionally ready. <laughs> I'm emotionally ready now that we saw some action. Um, are yeah. there ways that you help people, you know, some tactics that that you've seen or when you meet somebody and you know they're at that cusp and maybe they need a little push or they need a little help? Yeah, it's really interesting. Well, first of all, I, I will say I, what I'm about to describe, I, I was a, the, the problem child too. <laughs> but we started something in Endeavor where we had it already selected Endeavor entrepreneurs come back through one of our selection panels just to get feedback on where mm. they are. And what's super interesting is these people are, they think they're at a pivot moment, mm. but not the one they're actually at. So they think, oh, well, I've grown to you know, 20 locations. Now I need to get it to 200. And they're going to give me tactical feedback on how to do that. Or maybe I'll make a great connection. Or really, I need to raise the next mm -hmm. you know, Series C financing. And they're going to tell me that. And inevitably. People look and they listen and they go, nope, you're the problem. <laughs> you are a one person show. You are too stuck. And it's always, we just had this uh, you know, uh, two sessions ago. And I had to do the same thing. I was preventing Endeavor from scaling mm. because I had to go start every new office. I was the one who had to create the culture. And someone said to me, unless you're, not, you're stopping a micromanager, we're never scaling because how many planes can you physically get on? And that was the biggest shock. But that's what I always say. When you're in a moment, look at two things. What are your employees saying? What are your customers saying? And you hear, once you break through the noise, you start to listen to what you were ignoring before. Mm -hmm. You uh, find the signal in the noise if you turn your listening ears on to all of those signals, right? And they're always there. Mm -hmm. And they've been there. You've just ignored them. And I think also people are afraid of change. That's a very natural human response, so if they just stay in their safe place. Yeah. But realizing that standing still is as much a choice as taking action, sometimes that helps people get over that hurdle and, and into momentum. Yeah, I think you look, if you look at the, the Fortune 500 companies, the, the topple rate, the rate of companies getting off that list. You know, Mercado Libre, one of Endeavor's companies, just toppled Yahoo off the NASDAQ 100. You stay the same, you're, you're, you're dead, right? There's an upstart that's going to come get you. And that's true if you're a manager as well, mm -hmm. right? Unless yeah. you're constantly changing, there's going to be some millennial or some kid out there that's doing something differently. And so staying the same, what I find interesting is people think it's the safe path. Yes. And it's the riskiest path of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree. So when you talk about building relationships, and, and that's been a big part of Endeavor's value proposition yes. is building relationships yes. and those ecosystems, as you were saying. Um, what can you say about advice to companies for building networks even internal to their enterprise. So 
Mm. It's different, you know, it's, as you said, it's very difficult sometimes even internal to an enterprise to build those connections. Any lessons that, that you've learned on how to build relationships that might help in future of organizations discussions yeah. as everybody's evolving their own companies? That's a very interesting question. I would say two, one external, one internal. And external, um, I am known as the stalker <laughs> because <laughs> I always found I didn't like going to networking events and just handing my business card in the same way. So I always look for people in the moments like where they're coming out of the bathroom or where you're, you're on the plane, they're trapped. Usually being trapped in a physically confined space is helpful, but you can do it nicely. <laughs> but I've met so many people because it's just they're, they're more open. Then if you, if you just get into yeah. the moment of exchanging the business card, they all go in your pocket, you forget, right? Mm -hmm. So finding these moments and then really making that, that connection. I would say internally, you know, I think there was for so long this idea of the corporate ladder mm -hmm. and one mentor to guide you through. And I was like, you know what? Save monogamy for your private life. We have to be poly mentorish. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> I think that what happens is, you know, back to these verticals, and people don't want to stay the same. Even someone in marketing today, you know, actually may have creative idea that helps engineering even tomorrow. And I mm -hmm. think that being more interdisciplinary and having people older than you and younger than you and in your department and outside your department and creating these circles of mentors, including yeah. reverse mentorship. I mean, often now companies today, you have the Luddites, anybody over, you know, 40 or so, and uh, and the, the young people coming in are, are teaching yeah. the, the new uh, tech um, tactics. So I think that um, giving those spaces for people to develop mm -hmm. these mentoring relationships that aren't like, this is your formal mentor, but I think that companies can really do that and get people out of their silos and, and working together. I love that you just gave tips on stalking people in <laughs> airplane bathrooms and poly mentorists. I think those are great takeaways. Um, so, it, you know, it's about a little bit of, of, of self-awareness, I'm hearing you say, yeah. right? Uh, both on identifying when you're ready to transform, as well as self-awareness in knowing how to unlock the power of networks within, you know, external networks and internal networks. Um, do you have any examples in any of the companies that you've worked with where you've seen them build networks or as you've helped connect people that it really unlocked something that maybe wasn't there before? Well, I see that's what we're doing on an ecosystem basis. Yeah. And if you look, let's take Argentina as an example. Mm -hmm. um, when we went 20 years ago, uh, there, were, there were almost no people starting companies. Uh, there wasn't the word entrepreneur that was used, empresario mm -hmm. was used as the big Swiss bank account, uh, you know, people with government connections. Emprendedor has come into the lexicon, in fact, because of a lot of the stories that, that we mm -hmm. saw and, 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 and helped to spawn. So when you had Wences Casares of Patagon.com that sold to Banco Santander for $750 million, and then you have him creating Zappo and becoming a serial entrepreneur, and then you have Marcos and Hernan from Mercado Libre starting what is now the highest valued company in the country of Argentina, and then Marcos is a mentor to uh, Gebert and the Martins and Nestor in and, and starting um, Globant, and now they pay it forward, and, and Gebert is the chairman of Endeavor Argentina and their angel investing. We actually have mapped out how these connections transform an ecosystem, and it does. It's the multiplier effect. So you went from two or three isolated cases, and in a lot of countries, that's all they have. Mm -hmm. And like Boston, they have competitive arrangements, and you don't want anyone you know, losing anybody. And if your CTO goes to the next place, then you, you know, you, you're done with that company. And the, com the, the, the places where you encourage this networking and this exchange of ideas, exchange of talent, mm -hmm. um, exchange of capital and resources and stories and inspiration, you can actually map out where companies will go from two entrepreneurs to 20 to 200 to 2,000. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, to me, what's exciting. And so I think if you take that and apply it to your own company, imagine if you unlock those people and get yes. them not to be competitive and to have it about their bonus or their team's well-being, but if you can have them have built-in incentives to unlock the power of others as well, I think that's when everybody wins. Yeah, I think, I think that's really a great message. You know, I think that people do try to um, instinctively keep their arms around things, or if someone leaves their company, worry about 
you know, they're dead to me, instead of opening the doors and saying, you're now an ambassador of, yeah. you know, this culture. Well, right. Reed Hoffman, who's on our board and a good friend I was just with yesterday, talks about tours of duty. Mm -hmm. And he says, if people are going to have, you know, most people, millennials, I think, are going to have 11.7 jobs now in their life. So it's not like you're keeping anybody forever. So yeah. you might as well create these ambassadors for your culture. Mm -hmm. But I would say even internally, you know, when I was going through uh, graduate school in my early years, everyone was talking about GE and then later even Amazon, where basically you knew that the bottom 10% were getting cut. Mm -hmm. And then the 10% the after that were getting almost no bonus. And then the, so it really was this kind of dog eat dog world where your well being depended on making sure others were below you. Mm -hmm. And I think that this new wave, and I think Globant again is, is, is built into its DNA and culture, how can you create these win-win mutually supportive environments rather than ones where it's just it's, it's comp competition to the point of ineffectiveness? Right, and instead empower and uplift other yeah. people in the organization, right? So as you were talking about um, you know, bridges and ecosystems and connecting different relationships that maybe were not intuitively valuable, yeah. but, but there was something there. Yes. Um, I, I can't help but start thinking about how yes. um, AI and technology, right? Totally. So do you have any thoughts on, on how that could really empower some of that ecosystem creation? Yeah, again, I was just in Silicon Valley yesterday with um, some of the top CEOs, and they were all saying, you know, we all know, you know, AI is going to change the world, but we don't really know how. And even Elon, who Elon Musk has come out saying, you know, it's, it, it, AI will be the end of us, is creating an AI division within Tesla but in SpaceX. But no one really knows what AI is. So for everybody here who's like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, what does it really mean? And for me, working outside the US a lot in these emerging markets, here's what it starts with. It starts with big data, and it starts with gathering data where none had been automated before. So we're seeing, for example, in places from Brazil to the Philippines to you know, Indonesia to Saudi Arabia, companies starting in health tech or ed tech or ag tech um, automating data and actually collecting it so when there is that machine learning, you have to have right. the data actually see the patterns, right? So it starts with the data. It starts with the relationship with the customers. We're seeing now a huge transformation in terms of everyone, I think, pretty much trusted Google and Facebook and, mm -hmm. and uh, Twitter. Those days are over, right? So now you have to explain a little bit more to your customer, what, what are you doing with my information? What, what are those ads mm -hmm. you're selling to me? And so I think that thinking about AI starting with the, what data are we collecting, what patterns do we eventually want uh, mm -hmm. uh, the machine learning to help analyze, and what is our relationship with our customers so we don't lose the trust. I agree. I think that uh, any investment in new technology, whether it's artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, whatever words that you'd like to use, um, you still need to respect any of your regular rules of investment, right? How would you look at investing in any new technology and look at whether there's a market opportunity, what your customers are telling you, how is right. it going to change your business? Do you have any examples of the businesses you've been working with that fall into that kind of foundational de data category? Yeah, I'm, right. We talked about several that are looking at healthcare. We have a company in Brazil that has cut emergency room deaths in half. Why? Mm -hmm. Because nothing had been automated. So it sounds so simple, and yet what I, what, there are so many you know, old industries that have actually really important data. And I think mm -hmm. the when we think about digital transformations, right, only is creating the next cool app or just mm -hmm. yeah. really what we have to do is what data, what things the, the basic infrastructure, the basic old companies have that we need to get our hands on. That to me is much more important than what's the cool new app. It's mm -hmm. how do we get access to that data in a way that will become even more relevant than we know today. And in these emerging markets where they yeah. have a different starting point, you know, are, are you seeing some big differences there in the way they're approaching these topics, maybe compared to North America or Europe or... Yeah, I think they think about tech-enabled transformation rather than maybe tech-centric transformation. Yeah. So I think that rather than thinking about what's the next app or what's the next gamification thing that I'm going to do before anyone else gets there, they're basically saying, our health system is not working. Our agribusiness mm -hmm. isn't working. Our ed education. How can tech 
enable a transformation um, that will magnify what these you know, old school sure. businesses are doing, but help real people's lives. And so I think people start by saying, there's a lot of problems, there are a lot of pain points, mm -hmm. let me solve the lives. And with that, it comes this tech enable transformation. I got it. So they're looking at a problem, a big yeah. problem, a, a real transformation that they need to make. And oh, by the way, what are the solutions that I'm going to need to use from technology to achieve exactly. it? Exactly. And so yesterday when I was with uh, Reed and I was with um, uh, uh, Brett Taylor, who was the guy who built Google Maps and he was the chief technology officer of Facebook and now just uh, sold a SaaS company to, to Salesforce. And I said to him, okay, well, you guys are figuring out what these robots are going to do and the machine learning. <laughs> All the Endeavor entrepreneurs around the world are collecting all the data that you're going to need because the patterns in India, the patterns in, you know, in, in uh, South Africa are very different than the ones you're seeing in, mm -hmm. in New York City and Los Angeles. Right. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. That's fascinating. Um, so if we think about all of these different opportunities and, you know, kind of to, to take it yeah. back to the beginning, full circle, uh, the premise that you began Endeavor with that, you know, it can't possibly be that all of the good ideas exist in Silicon Valley, right? There's a world right. full of people. Um, any thoughts on how AI uh, and just advanced technologies may allow you to start identifying some of those entrepreneurs differently? Well, I was going to say something, you know, t slightly different to sure. bring it home to, to Globant, which is that I think that back to the idea of creating digital journeys for people mm -hmm. and digital transformations yes. and, and startups within these, these big companies. I mean, really back to that mindset, if we talk about mindset, culture, mm -hmm. and then what problem are you trying to solve yeah. and, the pay, and, and then the data points. I mean, to me, that is the journey that Globant needs to take. Do they have incredible creativity? Yes. Incredible engineering talent? Yes. But I think people are terrified. Yes. And I think people hear these words, and it, they become the buzzwords, right? And, um, and it was SaaS before, and now it's AI. It'll be something else. And I think when you look and you say, look, who are your customers? What problems are they um, having that you're no longer you're not able to solve today? Mm -hmm. Where do you need to be five years from now, ten years to, to solve these problems? Number one, how do you get your people there? How do you motivate your uh, employees to reorganize themselves? Because they're going to have to break down these silos that they have now. How do we do things and help them reorganize? And how do you get them over their own fears and, and create those incentives, as we talked about, for them to take their ideas out of yeah. the shower and into the world? And then lastly, I would ask this question, which is what data do you think you are uniquely suited to find mm. so that whether you're building the bots or somebody else's, that the machine learning is only as good as the data we have? What data do you control? And how do you make sure you capture it in a way that doesn't lose the trust with your employees or your customers? To me, if you ask those questions, which sound very basic and human, but I think tap into the real fears behind these big buzzwords, yes. that's where I would start. Yeah, I love that. And I think that we think of ourselves often as the therapists, yes. helping people kind of draw all totally. of those fears out into an actionable and productive uh, discussion, right? Totally. So uh, I think that we probably have time for maybe only one or two questions. And so let's see what we can, who, who we've got. Questions? They can be for Stephanie, too. <laughs> if you want other stocking okay. tips, I also have some stocking tips. Oh, really? What are your stocking tips? Stocking <laughs> really is an underrated startup and scale-up strategy. Well, and actually relevant. Uh, oh, let's go I to the question. <laughs> so what, what region are you most excited about? What? You guys are opening new, uh, new offices throughout the globe. What region are you most excited about? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I feel like Latin America is finally coming into its own. And I think places like Argentina and Brazil, which are, were off the radar, are really finally now we're seeing Mexico. So we're starting to see that finally after, you know, frankly, 20 years of being there start to have players thinking at a regional but also international scale. Um, I really think Indonesia is very exciting. And I think that we hear so much about China. We're also in Japan. But I think Indonesia is, uh, and what's going on in Southeast Asia, has real um, huge potential. And you have um, 
Uh, for example, one of our companies um, is a mobile payments company that actually has formalized the informal economy, and it's about to become the main payments platform of a, a, a large disruptive company. It'll be, I can't say the name because it'll be announced in two weeks, but that's super, super exciting. And I would say two more. I would say um, we're just launching, we just launched in Kenya, and we're about to launch in Nigeria. I think, again, uh, Africa is probably where Latin America was maybe five or so years back, 10 years back, but it, you, that has, I think, regional transformational potential. And the last and most surprising thing is Europe. So old school Europe, we are seeing really interesting innovations coming out of places like Spain and Italy. We have a company in Italy that's the smallest wearable technologies uh, com in company in the world. NASA and MIT use their technology to predict epileptic seizures before they happen. So when you think of old Europe, uh, you don't usually think of innovation. And I think that's changing too. But that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the beginning, you were mentioning that uh, leaders is one of the things that you look at first in your organizations. Yes. What advice would you give to leaders that are about to go through a digital transformation and that are a bit afraid of the disruption that it will generate in their organizations? Well, I would, I would tell you not to hide your fears. I think the biggest learning I had as a CEO is I thought I had to show everyone I was fearless. And they could, I wouldn't worry because then they'd get nervous. And also I thought, frankly, as a female CEO, I had to show independence and strength. And I did, but um, now, actually, uh, nine years ago, my husband was diagnosed with um, very aggressive bone cancer. And I had three-year-old twins at the time, they're now 12. And he um, was going go to go through a year of chemotherapy. He got his entire femur replaced. We did not know if he was gonna make it. The odds were not really good. And so I just said, all right, I I I'm going to every chemotherapy session and then I'm there for my girls and I'm gonna come to the office almost you know, very little. You can reach me if you need to. And he, he survived, he's nine years cancer free. But when I went back to work, I was very nervous because I thought, oh my God, I don't want to talk about this. Then they're going to treat me in a different way. They're going to see my fears. I'm going to be vulnerable. This is going to be a mess. I'm going to be weak. And the opposite happened. Mm -hmm. And to, uh, you know, I, I, they asked what happened. I, I, I broke down, I think. I told them what was going on. And I remember two of the youngest millennials on my team came up to me and they said, Linda, we just want you to know that before you were superhuman, but now that we see that you're vulnerable and real, now we'll follow you anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I said, wow, I had spent all this time trying to be superhuman when I had to learn to be less super and more human. And I think that doesn't just have to happen with cancer. I think this can happen with when the world is changing faster than we thought and we're always being disrupted. The world is a disruptive place. And I think if we show our own vulnerabilities, I actually think back to that permission, we actually give people permission to maybe come up with the crazy ideas where if we feel like we're in control and have it all, then their insecurities, they don't wanna show the boss. That's what I would say. I love that too, that's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Hey, Thank well, you so now much. There's one oh, more question. Oh, Linda, uh, Richard Boyd, I was just stalking you on LinkedIn. And, uh, <laughs> saw that we have mutual friends in Reed Hoffman and Joichi Ito who are yeah. famous for their ideas around disruption. Have you read Whiplash? And what do you like most about their ideas around compasses over maps and innovation, et cetera? Um, well, Joe Ito is brilliant. He's now head of the MIT Media Lab. And I just, um, I love that he has architects and artists working for him. He doesn't just have engineers. So I really, from what, to me, Joey is about that interdisciplinary mindset. Um, Reed and I, had, we're just talking about our friend Neri Oxman, who's redefined you know, architecture and art. And she has um, these, these uh, installations at the MoMA. She's hired by Joey at the uh, MIT Media Lab. And same with Reed. You know, he's now thinking about, to, there was a, 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 a firewall between technology and, and government. And I think that he's now realized, no, we have to start thinking about this. And we have to realize that what I was saying before is people's perceptions of us as the good guys who are great and they'll give us all the data is changing. And unless we proactively start solving problems, like not having foreign entities, you know, hack into our systems, mm -hmm 
Then we're gonna get the regulation we don't want. So I think he's, he's not, he, well, he's someone who's always thinking four steps ahead and how I'm gonna anticipate and solve the problems of tomorrow so that I have better outcomes than just leaving it to someone else. So those are, it's, it's about that mindset that I admire both about both of them.